All right, well, we are back to work on the C6 Competition Drift Car Build. We've been hammering out projects on this thing. We've been neck deep in the fab projects. That stuff has been taking up a lot of time. It's tedious. It needs to be very well thought out if it's going to work efficiently. And a lot of other stuff has been on hold until that was done because a lot of things revolve around it. It's kind of a domino effect. And it meant we really needed to get this stuff done first. So with most of it done, all of the stuff that really matters can start diving into the rest of the build. So it's a perfect time to start throwing on a lot of these other parts. So we've got a lot of stuff here. We've got our pedal box. I was waiting to figure out what brakes I was gonna run to order the master cylinders. We now have those. We've got an Earl steam vent kit. We've got a mini starter. We've got our fire suppression system. We've got our Rife sensors. These are really cool. We'll get into these when we start mounting them, but I love this setup. Coolest thing ever, in my opinion. It makes everything so much simpler, cleans up the wiring dramatically. So we've got a four sensor block. So we'll have one six pin connector for all four of these sensors. We've got MAP and three pressure sensors. Then we've got two temp sensors that are gonna plug in with these little M5 cables to our two sensor block. So since this still has a six pin connector and we only have two sensors, it comes with two M5 connectors so we can add two more sensors for total, which we're gonna use these little nice little cables for. And then we have eighth MPT temp sensors. So we're gonna be monitoring all the things on this build. The more data we can have, the better chance we have of keeping this thing together. I mean, we're gonna be monitoring fuel temp, coolant pressure, uh, crankcase pressure, back pressure in the turbo system, as well as all the other stuff. So I'm excited for that. It's gonna be good to have that information and be able to spot problems early on and hopefully fix them, resolve them. So could jibber jabber on and on about the parts we have and what we need to do, but might as well just start doing it. So I think the first thing I wanna do is dive into the pedal box. I couldn't really even mock this up in position without the master cylinders because the pedals just flop around. Start figuring out how we want to mount this thing. You know the drill. Enough jibber jabber, let's get to work. So we started assembling our pedal box. This is something I have been antsy to do for a while because like I said, I couldn't even mock this up in there. I tried to hold the pedals and do stuff to get a rough idea of where it was gonna go, but it was literally impossible until we got these on. Now we did run into a bit of a problem of course they use standard hardware. I have tons of metric hardware, no standard hardware. Now this turns into a bit of a debacle, uh, but it turns out I had them the whole time. They came in the box, I put them in another box. What do you know? But we decided to move on to the turbo mount. This is designed around using round tubing. So you can either plug weld it or butt weld it. I have a tubing bender, but it's not built yet. It's it's in the container and storage because I was waiting until we got the shop done and had more room because there's really not a lot of room in here to set up a tubing bender. Even if I did, I don't have the dies for this size tubing. and I don't have this size tubing. So I thought, you know what? Maybe we'll just do it out of square tubing. It's a pretty short run. You're not really gonna see it anyway. I would have to cut in 45 around tubing, which would probably look uglier. So I've got two different pieces of square tubing here. So I could plug weld with this, get a lot of meat on the weld there, or I could butt weld with this tubing size. Now this is not really what this mount's designed around, but I could trim this and get this to fit in real nice. I'm leaning towards using this. It's a little thicker and it's obviously bigger. So it's gonna be a good bit stronger. We, I think this might be a little too, a little too dinky. Yeah, that's gonna have too much flex, I think. So I guess let's try to do it with this. Let's see what we can make happen here. I really wanna get this turbo mounted. We've been supporting it with a jack for quite a while. I'm sure it's okay as it is, but I don't wanna put unnecessary strain on the exhaust for longer than I need to. But if we can get this mount done, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We can leave all this stuff together and hooked up and not be worried about the turbo hanging there under its own weight. So before we could get started on this turbo mount, we needed to set the car back up. We had had to move everything around because we were working on the shop and I wanted to get this thing centered just perfect in the garage before we took it off the dollies and put it on the quick jacks and started tearing into it. I, there's nothing worse than having the car positioned all weird, but it's already up and the wheels and the suspension are off and all this stuff's taken apart and you don't want to move it. So we have limited room in here. So trying to find the best place for it can be a little tricky, but we got it back where we wanted it. We got it lifted up. Now we need to yank the front end off it. The front end's not really gonna interfere with our turbo mounting. Our turbo is already placed by the exhaust. So we know where it needs to go. We just need to build a mount to support it. So we go ahead and rip the front end off. It makes it way easier to access everything. And then it's time to start working on the mount. So our first challenge here is that this doesn't quite fit on there. It's the right size, but since this has this plaque, that rivet 
is just in the way. Now we could take the plaque off, but I don't want to go prying the plaque off a brand new turbo. So we're just going to clearance one side with the carbide burr enough for it to slip on there. It doesn't need much, just a millimeter or two. Of course, we also need bolts for this because I don't have any socket head 20 mil M8 Allen's. All the hardware I have, all of this new hardware, and I don't have exactly what I need. So after having the mount in place, taking some measurements, we had to kind of cut it a little short because the steering rack was in the way. We couldn't go all the way to the subframe and then straight down. And it's always kind of tricky to get the length of a 45 just right because you're measuring the long side and then the short side. It's not super clear cut, huh? See what I did there? So we needed to change our saw blade over to the steel blade so we don't tear up our stainless blade. We get our first piece cut. Being really methodical about this, we don't have a ton of extra material and I, I'd like to get this right the first try. So after taking some more measurements, we cut another long piece. We've got our 45, we've got our support essentially. So we go ahead and tack the first piece to the mount and then get that back in place and see how it all fits. All right, we got the start of our mount. Perfect length to not hit the steering rack. Problem is just where it lands, right on this, whatever this triangle is. I have no idea what this triangle is here for, but we had a minimum need to grind this down, but it lands just right next to it. So it's, we can't run the plate on both sides. It would have to be the plate off to one side. It is challenging. So we gotta come up with how we wanna proceed. But in the meantime, uh, so we went to Ace twice and we ended up finding the nuts that came with it. So uh, we're not gonna talk about that. But this thing is now a complete unit, and we can put it in the car and then see where we want it. Editor, don't edit that out. Editor can't help you now. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time playing around with this, knowing that this is going to be pretty critical to how the car feels. And it's, it's tough because I've never had a floor mounted pedal box like this. So it's hard to tell exactly where it's going to be. But I finally found a place that I was happy with it. We also checked where we were going to put the reservoirs. And I kind of cut Hostway loose on it, trying to divide and conquer at this point. So I was like, this is where I want it. We marked it. And then he was on his own to figure out how to mount it. So that was that was kind of nice. I could start working back on the turbo mount while he was working on that. So I got the lower leg piece tacked on and then went ahead and cut a plate out. I ended up cutting it back out again out of quarter inch because there's going to be a lot of leverage on this plate and it's going to need all the stiffness it can get. So we got it all in position, tacked it all in the car, and now it was time to weld it out. So I tried to be very cautious when welding this out. It is a very precise fit, especially since our turbo's already positioned with the exhaust, and if anything moves, then when we tighten it down, it's gonna try to tension the turbo one way or the other, and that's gonna kinda of defeat the purpose of the mount. If the mount is tensioning the turbo against the exhaust, then it's not really doing us any favors. So this was critical to get right. So with that done, it was time to drill our holes. So we centered these as best we could in this plate so that we had plenty of meat, and we started out with a couple of small holes. That way we could essentially use that to transfer the holes to the subframe before drilling out the plate itself to its final size. So we got all that done, we got it bolted in, and it was time for the moment of truth. Take the jack out and see if we can pull the hot side off and the turbo stays where it is. Now it's a little tricky to get the hot side out with all the lip flanges, but we got it out, turbo stayed where it was. All right, I went ahead and put the hot side back in. Everything still fit back together good. There was a little gap on this V-band, so we'll have to try to get that sorted once we put the double hole slip joint in here. But everything's good, the turbo, Super solid now. I mean, it, it didn't have any movement just hanging on the exhaust, but obviously that wasn't gonna last long. So happy with how the mount turned out for kind of improvising <laughs> since I didn't have tube or a tubing bender to use. All that is good and well. So down here, this way you got this plate done. So instead of doing, you know, holes for the bolts and then putting the nuts, welding the nuts on the back side of this plate, decided to recess the nuts into the plate like this because the floor is the lowest point. You know, most cars that we're used to, you have the floor and then the frame rail below the floor. 
So you're just trying to keep things above the frame rail. So you can have bolts and stuff sticking through the floor and it's not an issue. Whereas if you have a bolt sticking way below the floor, I mean, it's gonna be the lowest point. There's nothing to protect it from getting smashed. So that's why I wanted to do it this way. This keeps it tucked up as high as that brace there or above that brace there. So we're trying to keep everything tucked. So anyway, that's why we did it this way. Should be pretty uh, straightforward. I gotta grind here, grind a little bit there if I can get to it. Um, then we'll tack the nuts in, weld the plate in. Pedal box should be done and dusted. So let's whip the welder out. Get that cleaned up, get it welded in. Really happy to have that mounted. Happy with the location, it fits good. And like I said, we'll be able to service it without ever having to go down there. We can just take the bolts out from the top, pull the box out. So it's coming along nicely. So I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering. <laughs> well, let's get this welded up so we can move on to the next project. If you're ever welding under a car, it's important to wear earplugs. Otherwise, you might end up with a hot piece of metal slag in your ear. I've had it happen, and the sound <laughs> of that thing burning your flesh from inside your ear, it's not, it's not a pleasant sound, I'll tell you that much. Oh, all right, let's see what we can do here. So this was definitely one of those situations where I wish we were on a full-size lift to do this. It's not the end of the world, it's not terrible, but it is a little tight on there, especially with the roller. I had to get out and go get my welding jacket and such because you're just getting showered with sparks and it's a lot easier to get up close and personal and see what you're welding if you're not worried about getting smothered in sparks. So we get under there, we get those tacked in, we get the edges cleaned off. So the four pan is fiberglass. So when I'm welding this, I have to be careful to not go too crazy and not weld too much at one time because the heat will most likely burn the fiberglass. So I get good weld on the inside. The outside's kind of blocked by the quick jack, so we're gonna have to come back to that later, but we at least get a few tacks on it, and this is done and dusted. All right, now we need to see if it'll come out. Beautiful. All right, pedal box is officially mounted up. Take it back off, take the tape out, but do a little spray bomb job on that thing. Uh, I'm gonna have to finish welding it first. I'll have to take it off the quick jack, but we've got enough other projects to do. I just got a few tacks on it. It's just the, where I am need to weld is right under the quick jack. So we need to pull this Johnny back off, get a coat of paint on it. So I guess let's do that real quick before I forget. And then next thing I know the car is complete and I still haven't taken it back off. All right, we got this thing out here in the paint booth. Threw a coat of paint on it, letting it uh, dry in the sun. While waiting on that, we're gonna work on mounting the reservoir. So this is really kind of the best spot for it because it's it's not flat here. Um, and that's pretty high up, which I, I would like it high up so it's out of the way, but we don't know where the dash is gonna go. So I don't wanna put it in the way of the dash. So order of operations, before we can really mount that, we need to get the dash in here, which is something we've been, it's been on the agenda for a while. We actually almost cut it up to fit in the other chassis. So luckily we didn't do that. Now, since AJ at Bell Raceworks made this cage so tight fitting, it'll be really easy to cut the dash for this because when the cage bar is, let's say over here, now you've got to cut, you know, in the middle, you need to leave some on this side, but we're basically just gonna have to trim the side until it fits around this because it doesn't have to go around it. It's just gotta go next to it, if that makes any sense. So yeah, you know, big moment. Test fitting a freaking thousand dollar carbon fiber dash. For the record, it came with the car. <laughs> I don't know that I would have uh, balled out on something like that, maybe. So after the original test fit, we knew about how much we needed to cut off to start with. Now we're gonna try to sneak up on this. We don't wanna end up with some massive gap. So we decided to just kind of cut the mold corners off to start and see how that fits. So we go to test fit it back in and we can tell we need 
maybe a quarter inch or so more. It's it's hard to tell, and you really have to sneak up on it because when you're starting to put it in, it might be really tight and seem like you need way more, but once it actually goes in, you need less. So we're just taking it one cut at a time, one quarter inch at a time. So we've got it pretty close now, but it's not going all the way in. It's just kind of catching up on the down bars at the front corner. So we pull the shifter out. That's now officially in the way and cut just a little bit more off again, that last quarter inch. And hopefully this is the ticket. This is what we need to get it in. So we put it in there and it finally fits. It goes all the way in. So we start kind of messing around with driver positioning stuff and trying to see if this is really where the dash is supposed to be, right? We don't really have a frame of reference of how high or low or angled the dash is supposed to be from a stock vet. So we know it is sitting on the column a little bit, but we wanted to kind of get an idea, get a feel for it. I wanted to see how well I could see over it and just kind of see if we need to make any more tweaks. So we make a couple more tweaks and there's probably more to come, but the dash is roughly fit. All right, well, the dash is officially in. It looks pretty good from in here now it is sitting on the column here but it seems to be at the right height I'm, I'm trying to avoid notching it here because if we do this corner gives it a lot of structure and rigidity if we cut that out it's just gonna get it's just gonna get floppy so we're trying to avoid that uh, but man starting to look like a race car we got a pedal box we got a freaking carbon dash, carbon rear firewall. It's it's coming together. So I'm really happy to see this in here and that we were able to get it without over trimming it. That's always tricky. Um, so now, I mean, the main reason we decided to do this right now and start working on mounting our reservoir so it'll fit where we were looking to fit it, no problemo. We could even maybe go up there, but then we're definitely not gonna be able to get to the reservoirs. So I think this is the best spot. The back one's gonna be a little tricky to get to, but worst case, we can just kind of unbolt it and bring it out if we need to. Uh, but yeah, so super happy about that. We'll get that mounted up and then we can start measuring for lines. On another note, my mount dried. One benefit to the scorching Florida sun is that things dry pretty quickly. Uh, we did have a little incident where uh, the cardboard flew off and sent it into the dirt, but hey, it's a turbo mount that you're not going to see so we're going to let it ride. I want to toss this back on and then uh, we'll start working on mounting that reservoir. Okay. These new Milwaukee sockets are super nifty. So I've recently started to really like nice hand tools and it's kind of tough. There's not a lot in between. It's either real cheap or top of the line, crazy expensive. And I just can't justify that. It doesn't seem worth it to me, but Milwaukee started making a bunch of hand tools and their middle ground is so nice. I love that they, they always try to improve upon the design. So all their sockets have these little flat sections and you might think that's kind of pointless, but what it does is it makes it easier to grab it and pull it off the ratchet. The ratchet's super nice and beefy too. So uh, we went ahead and just put one bolt in this so that way we can level it out, get it where we're happy with it, and then punch the second hole. But quick tool time note, uh, this stuff's really good, man. I upgraded all my sockets to their brand. So we got the 3 8 the quarter inch, uh, and I'm really liking them so far. Another little cool thing they did is they added knurling on the extensions. So it just gives you a little more grip, especially when your hands are sweaty. I also recently finally got some of their flex head ratchety wrenches. So I've had the standard fixed ratchety wrenches for probably three years now or more. Um, and they are my go-to because the open end grabs it on four sides. It has these little release, boom, boom, boom. And it grabs it all the way around. So I've never had wrench slip or wrench flex. Whereas when you look at like a normal wrench, it's a U-shape down here. So you're really only grabbing it on two sides. If you've ever tightened or loosened something that's on there with the open end of like a normal open end, you know that they'll just pry apart and come off. So I really like these and I had some other flex head ratchets and they were falling apart. So I finally pulled the trigger on getting their set. And I like that their set goes from eight to 22 with no jump sizes. Cause there's a lot of times I'll need an 18 or I'll need a 22. I've used this 22 or this 22 more than I can count. So anyway, quick little tool time. I haven't talked about tools in a while, but if you know me, you know I love my tools. And like I said, I, I never really cared that much about having quality hand tools, but I've been using them more and more. And now it's like, 
There's nothing like a nice hand tool, a nice ratchet. It just feels, feels good. I don't know. Jibber jabber. We're gonna punch this second hole. Then we will take it all off, drill, rev nut, put it back on, and then that is done and dusted. So let's quit jibber jabbering and uh, finish this up. Yeah, look at it from that side. How does it look? Level? Level. Send in it. Uh, these are called, uh, I don't know what they're called. Transfer punches? No, transfer no, punches okay. are the ones that you screw in and they punch. This is, you get a kit and it comes in a bunch of different sizes. So you can put it in a hole like this and we don't have the exact size for this hole, but it keeps it pretty centered in the hole. If you just take a normal punch in there, you could be way off. So these are have come in really handy. I've used them even more than I thought I would. Did I take that ratchet? Can you hand me the ratchet? It's to your right, yeah. Took it over there when I was on, on my jibber jabber. Boom, look at that. Pedal box, pedal box reservoirs. Woo, thing is coming together, man. It's fun to take a break from the fab projects because the fab projects are so tedious and time consuming. It's like, it takes a lot of time to make a little progress where it's doing stuff like this, you can fly through some projects. So Sway's gonna get that cleaned out and we're gonna decide what we wanna tackle next. I wanna toss this starter in. So I debated on using an OEM style starter so it would be easy to replace, but I had a bit of a debacle with the Miata where the starter I'd bought and had warrantied once, they didn't make that one anymore and the only ones we could get were bigger with the replacement part number and it barely fit with the header and it's like I might as well just get a mini torque then because that was the only reason not to. And these things are pretty cool, man. This is my first one. This thing is tiny, tiny little guy. I like that it puts the cables on the side. Luckily, since we're single turbo and the downpipe's on the other side, we don't have to worry about anything exhaust-wise around the starter. So that's, that's definitely a nice change of pace. We don't have to worry about the wires getting melted or the starter getting cooked because exhaust is a long ways away. But we do need to get that in before we figure out how we want to do these lines. So let's toss this starter in while this way gets that cleaned up. Got some ARP bolts even just to, you know, spice things up. So I clocked it pretty wide, which means we can easily get up here to the crank sensor. We could probably even remove it without pulling the starter out, which would be immensely helpful because we don't really have anything that needs to go over here. And even if we did, we got plenty of room, but definitely one benefit to the single turbo is we keep the exhaust completely away from the starter, which is always a struggle with long tube headers. Sweet, another one bites the dust. All right, well, Josue is working on installing our Earl's steam vent kit. This is a really nice kit they make. Snazzy unit. I like the way they do it because it makes these clockable, which is very nifty. So what we're going to do is we're going to be tying all four steam ports together, and then those are going to all go into our water pump plate here, which already has an eighth MPT port, so it makes it super easy to do that. Uh, very important with an LS that you tie your steam vents together, at least run the front two. Do not block these off or your car will overheat. People try all sorts of stuff with steam vents to help LSs cool. It's, it's just, it's one of those things that's critical. So while he is doing that, I'm going to work on mounting our remote filter housing. So we had a bit of a change of plans on where we were going to mount the oil filter housing. We had debated on this a lot, tried it a bunch of different places it's a big unit and it needs to be serviceable so we decided to consider moving it back to our original location here at the front now one thing we needed to do before that was put the sway bar on now we weren't even 100 percent sure the sway bar was going to fit with the turbo but we couldn't put it in while we were dealing with mounting the turbo and building the hot side because the jack needed to go under the turbo, which the sway bar is in the way. So this is the first time we're putting the sway bar back on the car in a long time. Luckily, with the sway bar in, it looks like our filter housing is going to fit where we want it. Now we have another problem. This oil filter housing is meant to bolt in 
from the backside, that bracket is threaded. We need to bolt it in the other way because we're going to be bolting it into rib nuts on the frame rail. So we had to break out the uh, the man mill, the, the hand mill, <laughs> basically the car ride burr on a die grinder. So this is essentially what you'd be doing with a milling machine. And we're just doing it by hand, trying to see if we can make these holes big enough and slot them enough and cut out all the threads so that way we can get bolted in from the other side. So after a lot of man milling, <laughs> I don't know why it sounds so funny, but it does, we got it to work and it was time to mount our rib nuts. So same process as before. This is again, the, the best way to do it and ensure it's gonna fit right is to put one in first, bolt everything up and then mark and drill the second one. That way you just, you know that they're gonna be evenly and correctly spaced. It is hard to get two bolts right when you don't have a lot of margin for error and you can't just open up the hole if you get it wrong. So we start drilling out our second and final hole and we run into another little problem and that is that the downpipe is in the way of getting the drill in there. The short bits don't fit in the right angle drill of that size, and then the big drill's too big to fit, so we had to pull the downpipe out. Always a bummer to pull something out that you put in not too long ago, but one thing, you gotta do what you gotta do. So we put the filter in first to see if we can get the downpipe in with the filter in, not a chance. It is very tricky to get this downpipe in. So we had to pull the filter out, then put the downpipe in, get it attached to the rest of the exhaust, then put the filter housing back in, and we are done. All right, filter housing is mounted. Nice and secure, really happy with that location. It sucks that we have to put it right next to the downpipe. We mulled over this for a while. This is our original location and then we were gonna move it back here. But we are gonna do a lot of heat management on all of the exhaust, all of the hot stuff. So this, in theory, if we do it right, shouldn't be that hot. Now, it's a little closer to the downpipe here than it was to the header back here, but the header is gonna be significantly hotter than the downpipe. Your exhaust heat, is a lot hotter going into the turbo than coming out of the turbo because the turbo is a big restriction. So your exhaust gas, back pressure builds up, heat builds up, this is gonna get really hot. This will probably be 1300 degrees versus maybe 800 degrees on the downpipe. So while it was a, maybe an inch further away from the header runner, uh, the header runner is gonna be a lot hotter than the downpipe. So that was kind of the idea, not to mention if we put it there, it kind of ruins the point of it, right? It's hard to look into it. We can't open the top to service the screen up here. Draining it would be a pain. So this location is a lot better for all of that. And the coolest thing is we can just take the filter out and put a drain pan under here, which is amazing. On my Miata, you can't take the filter off without making a mess. You can't drain the dry sun tank or the vent tank without making a mess because they're all essentially inside, right? Uh, whereas these are dry sump drain, boom. Outside of the frame rail, drain into a tank. And even our breather tank, we can drain straight down into a tank, into a pan. So really excited about that the the serviceability of the oil system we should be able to drain fill do whatever we need to do without having to take anything off which is nice so we're trying to get everything in here um, because we need to start plumbing it so really all that's left is the oil cooler um, because that's where basically we're going to come out of the dry sump into the cooler out of the cooler into the filter out of the filter into the engine so that's the last thing we need to mount on that end so we were tinkering around with the throttle cable bracket so we have our motion raceworks icon throttle body and I went ahead and got their throttle cable bracket. However, with this fancy crazy billet intake, it doesn't fit. So I tried to bend it. Uh, first off, it puts this at a bad angle that I wouldn't trust long term. Uh, but second off, this can't open all the way because it hits the bracket because I bent the bracket. What I'm getting at is we got to come up with something. We got to build some sort of mounting bracket. All right, well, we flipped the throttle body, which honestly looks a lot cleaner because the, in the idle air control valves on the bottom. Uh, it does kind of mess up our plan for our coolant lines. We we're planning on running these under the intake back to a plate, but this is where the throttle needs to actuate. So that ain't going to work. So the reason we flipped it originally is there is a threaded boss on this intake right here. So I was thinking of building something off that for the cable, but we could also just come straight up with a little aluminum bracket with a hole in it. Simple enough. So we'll definitely be able to make something work. It's not the biggest priority at the moment, but that's good. So what we're gonna do now, since we're almost done figuring out the brake stuff, is we're gonna mount our handbrake master cylinder. So I decided to do this setup remote mount. This is how I did it in my Miata. It just clears up a bunch of room up here. So we're gonna have a rod that goes back and then our master cylinder back here. So we debated on how we wanna mount this, you know, whether we wanna build a plate for the bottom or whatever. On the Miata, I, I just did two M6 rivnuts. nuts. So I think if we do two M8 rivnuts, nuts, 
probably be all right. And then we just got to build a little rod in between. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to work on getting this thing mounted. I want to sit in here real quick and make sure I'm not going to smash my elbow into it. And if all is well, get that Johnny mounted, start building our rod. You're on that. If it's wrong, it's your fault. No, nope. it says 16 and a half, so if it's wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> True. So we started working on the rod first. This is gonna be the most challenging part, the most time consuming part, and really the most critical part. If this rod's a little too long, are a little too short, we're not gonna add the adjustment we need to get the handle positioned where we want it angle-wise, you know, straight up or tilted back or lean forward. So this is really pretty critical and it needs to be strong. I built one of these for my Miata originally and the way I built it, trying to make it adjustable on both ends, it bent the first time I really yanked on it. So basically what we're doing is this rod goes into the master cylinder, it clips in with a C-clip. We're welding that directly to the rod. So that way it's fixed, it doesn't have any adjustability, but it's strong. We drilled into the rod, we put it in, and we plug welded it. Now on the other end, we're welding in threads that are gonna thread into the heim joint that's gonna bolt to the handle. So same thing, we drilled a hole pretty deep in there, sunk it down as far as we could, and then welded it, and then this is a solid rod. So this is about what I have on my Miata, maybe even a little stronger, so I doubt we'll be breaking this or bending this, but the, the weakest point is definitely where it goes into the master cylinder, which is why we shortened that up and welded it in. So now, moment of truth, make sure it fits. Now we did leave ourselves a little uh, bailout, a little uh, get out of jail free card. We didn't mount the master cylinder yet, so that way if the rod wasn't quite exactly where it needed to be, we, we could uh, cheat it a little bit by where we mounted that. We also wanted to get the angle of the rod left and right sh as straight as possible because the master cylinder has to angle down a little bit, so we've already got a little angle that we're having to deal with. We don't want to deal with two. So we want to get it in line and pushed as far away from me as possible as well. That's the other big thing. So we get it all put together, put the shifter on, and just kind of start feeling it out and seeing if it's going to be a problem with my elbow. That's always a concern with these. So we try kind of every combination. It's hard to tell though. All right, handbrake system is officially complete. Really happy with the location of the handle, its proximity to the steering wheel and the shifter. They're nice and nice even gap between each one of them. So pretty happy with how it turned out. Now I can hit my elbow on this rod if I try. It's one of those things we won't really know until we actually go drift the car and you're kind of in autopilot mode. You're not thinking about where your arms are going that we'll know if it's gonna be a problem or not. It's hard to tell. My Miata was the same way. I thought I'd hit my elbow on it, never had a problem. So it worst case, if it is a problem, what we can do is a sideways shorter master cylinder, make my own bracket and drop this rod down an inch, inch and a half, and that'll give us plenty of clearance for the elbow. But uh, there's no reason to fix a problem we don't know exists. So for now, unless I change my mind, it's done. <laughs> so look at it from the other side. It's always easier to tell the driver's cockpit stuff from this side. So you can see it looks good. I really like these remote mount setups. And also, if we had just left this handbrake together, this would be here, this hole, the master cylinder wouldn't start till about here and then would come back to about here. So, and then we'd have a line sticking up out of it. So really it'd be more of an elbow hazard than this is, which is why we decided to do it this way. But one of those things, if we got to make a custom bracket, we got to make a custom bracket. I was just trying to utilize, I had this handbrake that came with the car. So, you know, we just took the handle off, used the Heim joint, used the bracket with the master cylinder, you know, just like basically just split it apart, but used all the, the stock handbrake stuff. So. Anyway, that being done, again, asterisk, happy with it. Uh, we wanna work on our clutch lines. That's another big thing we need to figure out to order all our brake and clutch lines. So I've got these two lines here that come out of the bell housing from the throttle bearing. And my idea was to bulkhead them here with dry brakes. The problem is where these lines reach to, I thought they would kind of reach further up. They're pretty difficult to get to. So to get down there and disconnect the dry brake is gonna be kind of tough. So we're debating that to change those lines, we'd have to pull the engine trans bell housing out, which should not be ideal. Uh, we are thinking about maybe putting them down low in the tunnel above the downpipe because we've got to pull the exhaust anyway to pull the bell housing, which is the only time we would take those lines off. So we're just trying to think through it. You know, I, I, I got the dry brakes, which are Definitely pricey, but to make this serviceability way easier, that way we can pull the bell housing out without ever having to bleed the clutch, which would be huge. Uh, so 
we want to make sure we get them in the right spot. So here's what we've got for our clutch and brake system. We have these Stubali, Stubali, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, don't judge me if I'm not, dry brakes. So the whole goal of this is so that we can pull the throw out bearing, pull you know the bell housing, get all of that out of the way, put it back in, hook it back up, and never have to bleed the clutch. That would save a tremendous amount of time if we've ever got to dig in there uh, at the track. So that was the goal. We've got these for the clutch system and the brake system. So if you don't know what a dry brake is, is exactly that, a dry brake. So there's seals, these two will connect, boom, fluid can flow through, and then we can disconnect them, and nothing will come out either end, everything will stay blood, and put them back together. Bada bing, bada boom. So we've got these right angle bulkheads, and then these unions. So the idea is, this is gonna come out of the firewall. Then we'll probably want, I don't know which end we'd want at the bottom. I would think this end at the bottom. So we need to see kind of what the stack height is with this hooked up to the lines and that'll give us a good idea of where we can punch these through. How does that look for getting to it? Okay. So we can basically go with there. This one's gonna be a little tricky because it's the line's way closer. So we played around a lot with where we wanted these to go because this is gonna be really critical if this is gonna be serviceable at all. The idea is to make this really easy to work on. So this, this took a lot of thought and we had to think through all the other systems that are gonna go in place, all the other lines and wiring and all this other stuff that's gonna go in there that might possibly get in the way of where we we're gonna put these. And then not to mention we we're pretty limited with where we could put them to where they could come out in here where there wasn't double layer, this or that, but we finally got it. We drilled the holes, we mounted them, we're happy with it. All right, there's where they come through. One's the clutch off the clutch pedal, and then one will be the bleeder line. We're running a bleeder all the way up here. That way we can bleed the clutch back to itself. Makes it way easier for bleeding. You can do it one person. Uh, then you can see on this side, there they are. So obviously not the most accessible place in the world, but I can get them from up here. We are gonna run our coolant lines up above them, so that'll get a little bit tricky. However, if we ever need to take those off, it's either because we're pulling the engine and trans out, so we're gonna have the headers off, coolant lines off, all that stuff off anyway, or we're pulling the bell housing out in the car, in which case we would have the trans out and, we could, and the exhaust out, and we could just reach straight up here and grab them. So I think we'll be good. I'm happy with that. It's something I've been curious about how I was gonna do it, where we were gonna put them, and man, it looks good seeing them tucked back there. Woo, she's looking like a race car, boy, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Another project checked off the list. I don't even think I had that on the list, did I? I wanna say I did. Did I have it on the list? Of course I didn't have it on the list. Why would I have it on the list so that I could scratch it off? Idiot. I have sh install ship boot on the list, but I don't have clutch line dry brake bulkheads. Can't mark it off the list, but the mental list. It's been on the mental list for a while. I wanna keep going with some projects, but it's getting dark outside, it's getting late. So I think we're gonna go ahead and end it off here. Pretty dang happy with the progress. Like I said, you, you get so used to how long fab projects take and how tedious they are for the result, which is very satisfying, but it's like, as far as systems getting done, it takes a while. So to knock out so many different things all in one shot, pretty uh, pretty happy with that. Really happy with how those bulkheads turned out. That location is sick. I'm, it has me real excited to start doing the lines. It's gonna be it's gonna be sick to see the lines start going in here. So anyway, I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering. I'm gonna let you guys go. We'll pick this back up. We got more work to do. We're we're getting there, man. I'm hoping we can get this thing done by round two. Been talking about it a lot on and off. I, I think it's feasible. My biggest question marks left are we're gonna add a, that double slip joint here. Just since I've already welded both sides, we don't really have any leeway if this doesn't want to line up great. So that I'm a little concerned about. The only other thing that's a question mark in my head is coming out of the turbo and into the inner core because it doesn't make sense for us to go down this way and you turn in like it was doing before. It makes way more sense to just you turn down and in, but the end tank next down and the turbo really would be about here so I don't have my metal brakes not long enough to redo this. So I don't know that I'm really still unsure of what I want to do and how I want to do it um, and how long it'll take. So really those two things, double slip there, that. The intake's going to be a little tricky too to get five inch out, but 
I mean, worst case, if we got to run a filter right here for an event, it's not the end of the world. Other than that, you know, it's like, it's all pretty straightforward and we're creeping up. We're trying to hammer out and get to the point where it's just lines and wiring, you know, plumbing and wiring. So we're getting there. We're getting there. So anyway, gonna go ahead and end it here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I will hopefully see you guys next time. Goodbye.